Hello class, in this video I'm going to explain what analytic consequence is and what the Anacon mechanism of Fitch is. This is one of the aspects of the book that I think is most confusingly put there, and in the software it obscures some of the fundamental concepts of the course, so in this video I'm going to attempt to set the record straight. You can find analytic consequence introduced by the book on page 60, which we're looking at here on my screen. The book tells you that analytic consequence is a little bit different than logical consequence. First, let me remind you the key feature about logical consequence we're going to contrast with. So remember how we learned that logical consequence is the consequence that depends on form and not content. So in some premises deductively entail a conclusion, we say that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. And any argument that has the same structure or form is going to be equally valid. So logical consequence does not have anything to do with the particular content, uh, rather it just has to do with the form of the sentences. Analytic consequence is fundamentally different then, because the book tells you what analytic consequence is, is inferences that depend upon the meanings of the predicates. It depends upon meaning, therefore content, and not just form. That's what the book tells you here. So it says, uh, the rule allows you to cite some sentences in support of a claim. If in any world that makes the cited sentences true also makes the conclusion true, given the meanings of the predicates in Tarski's world. The whole key of this whole sentence is the word meanings there. Because now that we're talking about consequence that depends upon meanings and therefore contents of predicates, we're not talking about logical consequence and logical form anymore. The book is not making this sufficiently clear. Indeed, the way that they build Anacon, the analytic consequence, into Fitch obscures it even more. So I'm going to try to dispel that confusion for you in this video. First, a little bit about terminology. You might remember all of these lessons if you understand where this terminology comes from. So let me do my best to give you a really quick explanation of the terms analytic and synthetic. Analytic is a term used first to apply to sentences. So we can talk about an analytic sentence. That's a sentence, by definition, that means a sentence that is true in virtue of the meanings of the terms. Like, here's an example. Think about the term, uh, the sentence, all bachelors are unmarried. Now that sentence is certainly true. And why is it true? Well, it's not, you don't have to take a survey of all bachelors and ask them whether they're married or not to establish that this is true. This is true just because of the, what the word bachelor means. To be a bachelor means to be an unmarried male or an adult unmarried male, something like that. It's, some, it's a fact about our concepts that guarantees this to be true. Or to, in order to explain the terminology here, what you have to do in order to understand that this is true is you just have to analyze the concept of being a bachelor and realize that the concept of being unmarried is a constituent or a part of the general concept of being a bachelor. Synthetic truths or synthetic sentences are different then. Like what if I said, definitionally by the way, synthetic truths are just all the ones that aren't analytic. So it's sort of defined negatively. Uh, I might say Joe is a bachelor. Now you can't just analyze the concept of Joe or the concept of bachelor and learn that Joe is a bachelor. Rather you have to do something more. You have to go out in the world. Now you do have to take a survey or do some research and find out what's going on with Joe. So. Uh, it, the analysis, this term comes for analyzing a concept. You can figure out this is true just by analyzing it. Whereas synthetic, something else is required to establish these are true. We needed something to bridge the gap between Joe and the concept bachelor because one is not a constituent or contained in the other. You can't get it by analysis. So there's like this third thing. It's like we have the world down here and this is doing the synthesizing between the concept of Joe and bachelor in order to turn this thing into, the, into a truth. So there's some other thing that's required to synthesize these concepts into a truth in this case, whereas there's just conceptual containment which guarantees the true truth in the analytic case. Now, that's analytic and synthetic sentences. How about analytic and synthetic consequences? Well, we can talk about logically true sentences and we can also talk about logical consequence. So we can talk about analytically true sentences and we can talk about analytical consequence. Analytical consequence would just be consequences inferences that depend upon the meanings of the terms, just like these analytic truths are truths that just depend upon the meanings of the terms. So if I had a consequence like uh, Joe is a bachelor, th therefore uh, Joe is unmarried. Now this is certainly valid. You're not going to be able to falsify this. Because if you make the premise true, you're going to make the conclusion true too. But notice this doesn't just depend upon the form of the sentences. Being a bachelor, that's just a unary predicate. As far as logic knows, that's just one random predicate. It's not a logical predicate. It's not given a special logical symbol like the identity predicate. Being unmarried similarly is just another unary predicate. Just because you have one unary predicate doesn't mean you're going to have some other random unary predicate. Rather, the connection between these 
is not based on form alone. It's actually based on the content of, or meaning of these predicates and that there's a non-trivial relationship between the meanings of the predicates. So here's a great paradigm example of an analytic consequence. If you're ever lost and wondering what the heck is analytic consequence, I just can't remember anymore. Try to go back to this example about all bachelors are unmarried, that sentence, or this inference being an analytically good inference or consequence. Now, that's the basic notion of <clears throat> analytic consequence, which basically unpacks what the book tells you here. Uh, and they're just not making it clear enough that this is fundamentally different from a logical consequence. Now, let's see what they say next. So you're supposed to go through this you-try-it mechanism and figure out um, <clears throat> whether these sentences uh, follow by analytic consequence or something else. Now, let's go down to see what the book says next. So here's an interesting fact. So they say you can use this in Fitch, but notice when you're doing so, it's not really a rule. We're going to call it a rule just because it appears among the, under the rule mechanism in Fitch. Now, let me tell you, that is a terrible reason for calling it a rule. Just because you built your software so it's called a rule in that doesn't mean it's useful to call it a rule. And we need to ask the prior question then, why did you build it into the rules mechanisms of the software if it's not really a rule? In fact, the word really should be deleted here. They're just fudging. It's not a rule whatsoever. The rules of Fitch are those that codify logical inferences. Analytic consequences are not logical inferences. That's what they didn't make sufficiently clear before. And now the fact that they build it into Fitch under the rule mechanism obscures the point even further. So don't listen to this fudge of theirs. It's not a rule whatsoever. So this is what you have to do when you're using Fitch. You have to be careful because when you look at the rule mechanisms of Fitch, let me just pull this up. I'll add a sentence. So look at this rule mechanism in Fitch. Under rules, you have some intro and elimination rules and reiteration. These are the real logical rules. It's only when you're doing this that you're actually doing real logical inferences and proofs. When you jump down here to the consequence and look at these options, this is no longer giving a, a formal logical proof, especially when you click the analytic consequence. That essentially depends upon the meanings of the terms, not just the form, and therefore it's not actually a logically valid inference anymore. It's merely an analytically valid inference. Uh, the tote and FOCONs, these are other consequence mechanisms too, which we'll discuss later in the course. They actually do bear a more important relationship to logic than the analytic one, uh, but I'm not going to try to explain that point now. Let's just focus on analytic consequence and what's going on with it. In order to make this uh, clearer, let me skip to a place in the book where we have to employ this in an exercise. So let's scroll down here to page 62 of the textbook and see where they start asking you to use this thing, Anacon. Like exercise 2.19. Notice this inference. So we have A is smaller than B and B is smaller than C. Therefore, A is smaller than C. Yeah, that's a good inference. It's hard, it's hard to dispute that. That's the transitivity of the smaller than relation. But notice, not all binary relations are transitive, so this depends upon a particular fact about the meaning of this binary relation that the smaller than relation is transitive. So you cannot prove this from logic alone. Cite all the intro and elimination rules you want. This is never going to come out as valid. Rather, we need to know something specific about the smaller than predicate. That's why you're going to need to use Anacon here. Um, okay, so let's see how this would go. Well, I'll just open up exercise 2.19 and do this proof for you. It's not going to take long, don't worry. Here's our here's our proof in Fitch. Our goal sentence down here, smaller AC. Uh, in order to do this proof, all we have to do is add the sentence, add our goal sentence down here, because our conclusion is going to follow immediately. Smaller AC. All we have to do is cite the rule. This follows by Anacon, because it follows because of the meanings of these. You're going to have to cite some stuff. It doesn't follow from Anacon willy-nilly. Uh, you need to cite some premises. It's, it follows because you know these other facts from which smaller AC follows. Ah, so look, ta-da, we finished it. Let's just check the whole thing out. See, my goal sentence is true, too. All we just did was cite Anacon, and it follows. Here's the problem with Anacon. Anacon... Anything follows by Anacon. Notice that 2.20, I mean, any any of these proofs which we ask you to prove, they follow from Anacon immediately. Let me give you another example. Here's 2.20. Here you have uh, three premises. So right of BC, left of DE, B and D are the same object. And what we're going to prove is left of CE. Now, this indeed does follow. And it follows, and we can just see that it follows by Anacon. Let's just throw Anacon in the rule mechanism, cite everything, 
And notice it's going to check out great. Hey, it checks out my goal sentence too. But wait a minute. I didn't actually do anything. I just cited Anacon and cited all the premises. And it's always going to check out if the proof actually works. And this is the number tr one trouble with Anacon. Anacon is not a rule at all. Basically, it's a cheat mechanism. Like think about cheat codes in video games. Cheat codes allow you to do all sorts of stuff that violate the real rules of the game, the way the game is supposed to be played. Well, the real rules, rules of Logic and Fitch are these intro and elimination rules. That's when you're playing by the game of Logic. When you cite Anacon, if the proof actually works, you never have to do any work. You don't need intermediary steps. Oh, I should have added those sentences before. Here. Here, let me see. Here, you don't need intermediary steps in here to get the proof to work. You can always just cite Anacon, cite all the premises, and it's going to check out. Anacon is just a cheat code for Fitch. That's why, if the book ever allows you to use it, they put heavy restrictions on it. They didn't put any restrictions on 2.19 for the simple reason that this is such a ridiculously simple case, there was no other work you could possibly do. In 2.20, notice there is other work they want you to do. They want you to not just cite Anacon like I did, they want to make you follow their proof because their proof actually traded on the fact that you can use an identity elim trading on premise number three. So if you go and do 2.20 correctly, you're not going to do it like the way I did. They're just attempting to uh, uh, disallow you from using Anacon as a complete cheat code because that's essentially what they did when they put that into Fitch. Notice where, this, where else this comes up in the book. So let's scroll down to some more exercises that involve Anacon. Okay, let me see if I can find one. Uh, here we go. So here I'm on page 66. Uh, so here, what are we supposed to do here? We're basically supposed to see if these are valid or not. If they are, we give a proof in Fitch using Anacon. And if not, if they're invalid, we just submit a counterexample in Tarski's world. Uh, this is interesting. So let's look at one of these. Uh, 2.24. Uh, B is larger than C. B is smaller than D. D and E are the same size, so E has to be larger than C. If you think about it and start building a world and try to falsify this, you're going to realize you can't. This indeed is valid. Now, if we wanted to give a proof of this in Fitch using Anacon, we could just cite the three premises, click Anacon for our rule, and it's going to check out because it's always going to check out with Anacon. But there's no work to do. Uh, that's why they have this... Um, little requirement. Look at this restriction. If you do use Anacon, you have to cite at most two sentences in each application. They're basically trying to backtrack and disallow you from citing all three of these at once and getting to the conclusion. So you sort of have to do a little bit of work. Let me just show you what they're asking you to do then, because you are going to have to do some exercises with Anacon later on where you are restricted to citing just two sentences. There's uh, I hope you can understand why they're making such a restriction. That's absolutely essential because otherwise it would be pointless to make you do any exercise with Anacon. Okay, so how are we supposed to do this? Um, the first thing I notice is my predicate in my conclusion is larger than. So what I want to do is I want to convert the smaller than information here into larger than information. So I'm just going to say larger uh, db. So I'm just using the inverse of smaller than. If b is smaller than d, then d is larger than b. Now, how does that follow? It's not going to follow by intro and elim. It doesn't follow by logic. It follows because of what the meaning of the smaller and larger than predicates are, that those are inverses of each other. So I can say this and anacon, and indeed now it's going to check out. Now I've got my larger than here. Look at this. I have larger than BD and I have larger than BC. So by transitivity, I know that D is larger than C. So I can now get larger uh, DC. Now, how am I going to justify that? It depends upon the transitivity fact about the larger than predicate, i.e. we have to know what that predicate means. So again, this is Anacon. Notice what I'm doing in my first application of Anacon, I only cited one sentence. So I'm obeying their restrictions about two sentences or less. In this use of Anacon, now I have to cite some things, but look, transitivity only takes two things, so indeed, this is going to check out too. All right, everything's good so far. Now that I know D is larger than C, how do I prove that E is larger than C? Well, it's quite helpful that I know that D and E are the same size. So if D is larger than C and E is the same size as D, then E better be larger than C too. So now I can just get to my conclusion, larger than EC and it should check out. What rule am I using? Well, I'm depending upon facts about size here, facts about the meanings of those predicates, and the non-trivial connection between the same size predicate and the larger than predicate. So I am using Anacon again 
but notice I've obeyed the rules of the pro problem. Every time I've used Anticon, I've cited at most two sentences. So they have to put those restrictions in here or else there would be absolutely no work to do. They want you to actually puzzle out and see how you can build in some baby steps and make this a genuine proof. But they have to do that because um, the, of what the Anticon mechanism is, that it's not actually a logical formal proof rule at all. Uh, it's a rule for doing something else entirely. It's a rule for looking at inferences. It is about consequences, how premises relate to conclusions, but it's not about logical consequence. It's rather about consequences giving the meanings of the predicates. Okay, we will talk more about the Anacon uh, mechanism later on in the course when we learn some more facets of logic, but I just want you to understand a few features of it now um, and the fact that it's so fundamentally different from logical inference and everything the book tells you about it and indeed the way they even build it into Fitch just serves to obscure that fact. Okay, thanks.